probably going to turn around soon. Oh, there's two ways. Holy crap, dude, this trail going on forever. It just got really quiet really fast. Welcome, dear viewer. I hope you are having a wonderful night. Tonight, I'll be telling some terrifyingly scary stories. I hope you are warm and ready. Let's begin. I've never really had any reason to be truly scared. Looking back, there isn't one experience I can think of that truly terrified me. I've jumped countless times, from sudden, loud noises to catching something moving in my peripheral vision. I cannot recall ever fully screaming or shouting, but maybe that's because I'm not a very outspoken person anyway, and would rather mask my feelings from others. I lost my eldest daughter once. She was two, and we were in Beck, a hardware store. They have model bathrooms and kitchens. There, I'm admiring some taps, tiles, or whatever it was. I turn around to the shower she was messing in, and poof, she is gone. That was terrifying, but I wasn't scared more frantic. Full disclosure, I found her taking a dump on one of the display toilets. Not my proudest moment having to tell the employee they needed a cleanup in aisle six. Anyway, so I haven't really been terrified, except once. It happened back when I was 17. I'd left school that summer and had six weeks before starting college. It was baking hot in the small rural town that I lived in. Situated pretty much in the middle of England, it's an old coal mining town, and a bit of British history here, all the mines were closed down, which decimated both the economy and job opportunities of the small pit towns throughout the country. Back in my town, if you're old enough, or at least look old enough, you spend your time in the local pubs. If you're not, you have nothing else to do but roam the streets, seeking your own entertainment. Me and my friends were the latter. On the main road through town, away from other houses, stood a dilapidated house known as the O'Briens. A four-story, six-bedroom mansion compared to all the other houses in town. There was an old couple who lived there who, at this point, had passed away some years prior, called, you guessed it, the O'Briens. They had two daughters who had moved abroad and had never claimed the house. So it just sat there for years, building up dust and rotting away. A perfect opportunity for somewhere cool, private and exciting for six teenagers to hang out. The house had a ridiculously big back garden, which was equally ridiculously overgrown. It literally took us the best part of a day to stomp down a pathway through the nettles and brush. Once through, there was a garage that we could drop down onto, which we pulled up the roof of to gain access to. We spent nearly all summer in that house, hanging out graffitiing the walls, drinking, smoking, etc. But there was one room that eluded us. From the garage, you headed through a kitchen, which now only consisted of a broken window that had been boarded up in a damaged set of cabinets on the back wall. You then stepped into a hallway that looked right through to the front door, with a bathroom and two other large rooms on the left-hand side. On the right were the stairs to the second floor. The staircase was built against a wall, and had wooden planks running vertically, directly opposite the kitchen door. Built into the back of the staircase was a large metal door that had been painted white, the paint now a sickly yellow dusty color and flaky. This door was locked. It simply wouldn't budge. The house was big enough that we just kind of forgot about the locked door. We'd spend most days up in the two rooms on the third floor, away from the road outside, to avoid any passersby hearing us and phoning the cops. That was until one of the lads decided, for no apparent reason, to light the moth-ridden curtain on fire with the Zippo he was messing with. The curtain, dust-covered carpet, and old, 
crinkled wallpaper went up in seconds. We only made it out by smashing the top window and jumping onto a dirt mound at the side of the garage. I think if adrenaline hadn't been coursing through us, it would have been a hell of a painful fall. We hid in some bushes over the road and watched the fire engine put out the flames. But before that, it had engulfed the second and third floors. The second was still usable once we got the courage to re-enter the house. But the third was gone. Just the outer walls and what was left of the roof. Shame, really. So, we were confined to the bottom floor. The garage was too dark to see in and only had an old table we'd found that you'd normally use to put the paste on wallpaper. We used it to get in and out of the roof. The kitchen wasn't much brighter, and the front room had a big window that overlooked the footpath and road outside. So that left us a small, bleak back room to chill in, which got boring very quickly. Boredom led to curiosity, and I noticed that one of the wooden planks on the side of the stairs was loose and that there was an open space behind it. Finally, we could see what was behind the metal door. What a mistake that was. They say curiosity kills the cat, but in this instance, it questioned my whole belief. The wooden panels were surprisingly hard to pull off, even for six fairly athletic teenagers. So we went out scouting and brought back a few torches and a crowbar. It was still a slog, but we finally managed to remove two and a half of the panels. Shining the light into the hole revealed another staircase that led downward. Yet, it looked as though it was decades older than the rest of the house. Cobwebs engulfed every surface, and the stench of musk and dampness attacked your nostrils if you got anywhere near the hole. After some giddy behavior, some pushing and shoving, and a game of six-man rock paper, scissors, I grabbed a torch and slowly stuck my head through the hole. The room was darker than dark. It was so dark that the beam from the torch could be seen cutting through the blackness. I shone it down the staircase first. It went down deep. The hole we had made was maybe four or five steps from the door, and there were at least 25 below it. At the bottom, a wall and a doorway to the left. I swung the torch to the right, towards the metal door, not expecting to see what I saw at all. The door was definitely locked and tight, with three separate deadlocks that ran down the side, all barred. But what caught me by surprise was that on the small lip of the top step, pushed firmly against the door, was a really outdated fridge, the ones that were square and about waist high, I told the lads, who stood behind me and they laughed, thinking I was joking. One by one, they stuck their heads in the hole, checked out the bottom of the stairs, and then the fridge. Each one is as confused as I am. I remember sitting down, smoking a cigarette and debating how and why it would be there. The door clearly opened inwards, which meant the door must have been locked from the inside, and then somehow the fridge was put up against it from the inside. We spent the rest of the day checking the garage and surrounding area of the house for a trap door or another entrance or exit to the cellar, but couldn't find anything. We put it down to the sheer size and state of the garden and went home. The next few visits to the house were spent trying to decide who would enter the cellar first. No one wanted to, and no matter how many games of rock, paper, scissors we played, it was always the best out of a higher number. Until one day, I'd had enough. We were sitting in a circle in the other room, messing with stuff and just generally chatting except for me. I just sat and stared at this hole, this dark void in the wall. Finally, I got up, exclaimed my intentions, took the torch from my pocket, and stepped inside. Everyone else quickly and very excitedly followed. Immediately, the first few layers of the wooden steps just disintegrated under my feet. They turned into a mulch of damp splinters that clung to the sole of my shoe when I lifted my foot. It was worrying, but the stairs seemed sturdy enough. With each step I took downward, the temperature dropped rapidly, and the air seemed to get thicker and thicker. The inches of dust that I kicked up also didn't help. Admittedly, I was a little scared, but I had five other boys behind me, so it was impossible to turn tail now. I headed down and reached the second to last step. I could see the doorway, which leads to an open room. Pausing, 
I regained my courage with a few shaky, deep breaths and stepped through. The room was in a worse state than the stairs. Webs littered the rafters and floorboards above like moss. They hung from the ceiling in clumps, all tarnished with dust. Weirdly, thinking about it now, we never saw any spiders. The floor was carpeted in a layer of debris from the rotting wood above, dust and dirt. It was a miracle none of us ever fell through the floor above. This place was a mess. The room was huge, expanding underneath the bathroom and both rooms on the first floor, and it was dark. There was no light source other than the torches three of us now carried. The room stood empty except for a wooden table smack bang in the middle. No chair, nothing was around it, but on it stood a metal plate crudely bashed into shape with the remnants of a black goo on it. Next to the plate stood a tall, uncorked green bottle. One of the boys went over to it and picked it up. It sloshed as he did so, with a deep brown liquid and layers of dirt inside. I never smelled it, but apparently it was putrid. At first, we didn't see the other doorway. It was in the corner directly opposite the one we had entered. No door just total darkness. We tried to shine our torches through it, but they didn't seem to cut through the shadows. It was like there was actually a door there, one that drained the torchlight. For some reason, I didn't muster the courage to go into that room, and neither did anyone else. We simply turned and left, feeling like we'd had enough adventure for the day. Over the next week or so, we invited girls and other friends to the house, but all refused to enter the basement. We found this hilarious, and we would dare one another, more to show off than anything, to go down there either on our own or in pairs without a flashlight and see how long we could stay down there. Now, not once did I get scared while standing in complete darkness down there. It was kind of calming, but none of us ever had the courage to enter the other room. In hindsight, we should have questioned more why the door was metal or why it was locked from the inside and how a fridge got up the stairs and was placed in front of the door as a barrier from the inside as well. But, full of excitement and immaturity, it never crossed our minds. We just assumed that there would be some sort of other exit in the other room that led to the garden. Word quickly went around through the year groups of the O'Brien basement, and we definitely fed the rumors of it being haunted. Teenagers would ask us how to get into the house and for us to show them the barricaded door or basement. So, because we thought we were cool, we spent another day making a maze in the garden, squashing pathways down that led away from the garage. We would then invite people into the house, lead them through the garden and into the garage, and show them the hole in the stairs. It got quite popular, and we decided to cash in on the opportunity. We told people that if they wanted to see the basement, then they would have to do the initiation. As they came in, we would have one person sit on the fridge and another at the bottom of the stairs, both with torches and send the people into the first room, telling them that they had to stay in there for 10 minutes with the torches turned off, and then we would let them out. This went on for a while, and it was fun at first. A lot of people bottled it as soon as the torches were turned off, but some stayed. We'd cheer them back up the stairs when they completed it. It was a cheesy little ritual we created, but still, everyone refused to go into the other room. When questioned, they just said they didn't feel comfortable until my little brother and his friend came. They were two years younger than us. And initially, we refused to let anyone who wasn't our age into the house. We were there all the time, and there were six of us in the friend group. So it was pretty easy to deter people if they managed to find the entrance at the garage. But after constant pestering and the initial curiosity of others dwindling, we decided to invite them along. We made a big deal out of it, taking them to the dilapidated fence at the back of the garden and tying their jumpers around their faces as we led them blind through the maze of shrubbery and thorns to the garage. It was a decent drop from the hole in the roof. And even though my brother managed it, his friend had to be lowered down by his arms. Once inside, they were met with the stench of smoke that lingered from the floors above. We walked them through the kitchen and showed them the makeshift entrance to the basement. 
We told them the story of the metal door and how it didn't make sense and gave them the option of staying in the first room. In pitch black for 10 minutes or going in the second room. In pitch black for five minutes. An offer a lot of people initially picked until they got down the staircase. Second room, they said in unison. We all laugh, expecting them to change their minds immediately. One of the lads slipped through the hole in the wooden boards and turned right, heading up the stairs and positioning himself on the fridge. I went through next and positioned myself at the foot of the stairs. I'd just like to say that, at this point, all of us regulars felt complete comfort going down to the bottom of the stairs practically alone. We'd all taken it in turns when bringing people down here and had done it numerous times each, so this time was no different. There was a giddy, nervous atmosphere when the two youngsters entered the staircase. The torches we used were cheap ones we'd gotten from the market, so they cast an eerie yellow glow. Slowly, my brother and his friend made it down the stairs, clearly attempting to show face and act unmoved by the state of the rotten, decaying wood around them. But as they trenched through the mulch, they stuck close together. They took their time, so much so that the guy at the top shouted for them to hurry and both nearly shitted their pants. When they finally got to me, I told them that this was the first room, shining the torch around the room through the doorway, and that they were to go into the next one, aiming my beam through the darkness to the frame of the other door. The room was a decent size, and as stated, the torches were cheap, but I remember taking notice that the beam that cut through the first room never seemed to illuminate the second room at all, as if there was an object obstructing its path. My brother's friend walked into the room, and as my brother walked past me, I grabbed his shoulder and told him that he didn't have to do this, and if he did, then he could back out whenever. With a nod and a dismissive wave, he followed his friend. They crossed the room, passed the table, and disappeared through the second doorway. As if walking through a dark stage curtain, I hit the button on my Casio watch to start the countdown from five minutes. I then aimed the beam of my torch up the staircase. The guy sitting on the fridge smiled excitedly and looked at his watch. I really need to piss, dude. I'll be right back, he said, jumping down and disappearing back through the gap. I stood at the bottom of those steps for what seemed like forever. I could hear the faint giggles from across the first room. They seemed muffled, as if hearing voices from behind a door. How long left? My brother's voice shouted. Three and a half minutes, I replied, checking my watch. Now, in the basement, despite it obviously being underground, there was never an uncomfortable temperature. It was colder than upstairs, but had no bite. There was never a chill. And while being down there countless times, not once did any of us feel any of us feel any sort of breeze. But this memory still haunts me a little, especially when there is a sudden shift in temperature. I noticed that I became very cold standing at the bottom of the stairs, to the point where I could see my breath when checking the time against the light on my watch face. The mumbles from the other room had also stopped. I tried to focus on them and see if I could hear any movement or the nervous noises they had been making before. But nothing. I remember getting freaked out. I don't know what about it, but I could feel my heart beating faster. The hairs on my arms and the back of my neck stood on end. I turned on the torch and stepped into the first room. Yo, you guys all right? I called out. Nothing. No reply. Oh, stop fucking about. Time's up. I called again and again. No reply. I shone the torch through the doorway of the second room, but just like before, it was as if the beam cut through the first room and then stopped at the doorway. I crept closer, calling my brother's name, but he never replied. Then as clear as day and so loud, it hurt my ears after the silence. A voice, deep, brash, and distorted, as if the sound had been twisted, bellowed. Leave now. I froze on the spot. Eyes fixed on the doorway then. Emerging from the gloom, ran my brother and his friend. Both are as white as snow. Both had tears and snot streaming down their faces. The look of pure terror on their faces is something I have never been able to get rid of. 
They bolted straight past me, which snapped me out of the trance, and I followed suit. Before we could reach the doorway to the stairs, the sound of crashing came from the stairwell. Four ridiculously loud bangs and the noise of snapping wood. The fridge was embedded into the wall at the bottom of the staircase. Without stopping, we all scrambled over it. The staircase itself was a complete mess. Large splinters of wood stuck up like spikes. Luckily, and I don't know how, we managed to clamber up on our hands and feet without injury. Halfway up, I looked towards the hole in the wall, praying it would be within reach. Both the young lads were in front of me, both sobbing and screaming. Both ran straight past the hole in the wall. The metal door locked before and with no key. We looked everywhere for it, stood open. Light from the garage exit spilled through the kitchen and down into the basement, as if it showed us the quickest way out. Instinct had set in by this point, and all three of us darted through the door, onto the table, and up through the garage. My brother's friend, who was too small to get down on his own, managed to get out without help. We ran through the garden maze. At some point, I had to grab hold of my brother to stop him from going down one of the many dead ends we had created, and without word. Take the lead. We raced to the fence, squeezed through the hole, and collapsed on the field behind the property. I looked around, and there, also sitting on the grass, staring at the three of us, was everyone else who had been in the house. No one said a word. Everyone looked as scared as each other, except for the two younger boys. They wept. For a long time, actually. As we all just sat there in silence and let them do it. Once they had stopped, we all got up without saying a word and went home. My brother said nothing to me on the way, or when we got back. He went into his room, I went into mine, and that was the end of that. No one went into the house again. It stood for a year or two, then was demolished. Apparently, one of the daughters had finally come over and claimed the land, only to sell it to some new builder. Now, a group of houses sits where the garden and house were. Nice looking houses, to be fair. My brother still refuses to walk past that estate. They never built on the land directly above the cellar, apparently, and I've never actually had this confirmed. The builders refused to fill the cellar in for some reason. They just bricked it up and left it as open space, despite being able to fit a perfectly good house on there. We only brought it up once within the friends group, and only because I convinced myself that it had been one of them that had somehow opened the door and moved the fridge. But they all swore it wasn't. They said that as soon as it started getting really cold in the house, they got spooked. They heard the voice and headed for the kitchen. They noticed the door was open when they heard the loud bangs and they bolted. I tried asking my brother about the room, but he completely shut down when I did. He quickly stopped being friends with the kid who went down with him, saying they no longer had anything relevant to talk about. There are pictures that show the house after the fire. You can see the smashed windows from the fire brigade and the black from the smoke around the top windows. The garage is behind. I can't see it in the photo. Also, photos of the cleared land and of the new build with the obvious patch of grass where the basement would be. I've told this story probably over a hundred times. And despite being the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me, I've come to appreciate that it makes for a great story, so I figure I'll share it with you all here. I should start by saying that I always hated going camping. My parents sent me to summer camp every year in Colorado, which involved at least one camping trip into the woods. Despite the brevity of these trips, I always resented them. The heavy bag, the lack of toilets, the spiders that always found their way into my tent. When I turned 16 and became a camp counselor in training, however, my distaste for the whole experience briefly changed. At that age, we were only a few years older than the oldest campers, but we were given considerable leeway in what we were allowed to do. Most nights, we would have to stay in the cabin with our campers, but it was rumored that the camping trip was a time where the counselors in training would get drunk, smoke weed, and hook up with each other after everyone else went to sleep. 
What I didn't know, however, was that the events of that camping trip would dissuade me from ever going camping in the woods again. The trip began like any other. Altogether, there were around 30 people on the trip, four counselors in training, four counselors, and around 20 or so boys and girls between the ages of 13 and 14, walking in a single lineup and down the various trails. You could hardly hear any sounds of nature over the conversations and laughter of the campers. Several hours went by, and we made our way through a dense marshy area and up a steep incline populated with evergreens and aspens. I wasn't the most athletic kid, so it was around this point that I found myself at the back of the line with one of the other counselors in training, Jordan, as well as two campers who were also struggling to keep up. The four of us started chatting, and in our distracted state, we began to fall more and more behind the rest of the campers, until the last of them faded out of view around a bend about 50 feet up the way. Unconcerned, we kept walking at the same slow pace, but after 30 minutes or so, the trail started to level off and I began to feel increasingly anxious. Not only had the rest of the group disappeared ahead of us, but we had entered a stretch of completely dead evergreens, half of which looked scorched by a wildfire and the other half appeared to have been killed by a disease. The eeriness of the landscape was punctuated by a small derelict cabin sitting in the middle of the scorched forest, seemingly untouched by the fire that must have spread through the area. We were so enraptured by the scene that one of the campers screamed when a twig broke behind us. Jordan and I started laughing a bit, but we quickly stopped when we turned to look at where the sound had come from. Not 20 feet behind us was a haggard looking man with a messy nest of black hair and a long black beard, slowly making his way up the trail with his eyes locked on us. He didn't appear to have any hiking supplies on him and we had no idea how long he'd been walking behind us. Being young, we were naturally pretty freaked out, but Jordan managed to give the guy a slight wave before saying to the rest of us, come on, let's speed up and get back with the rest of the group. As we turned to continue our way up the path, the man mumbled a question that was hard to hear, and I was shocked when Jordan turned around to ask the man to repeat himself. The man muttered again, slightly louder, going camping, Jordan told the man that, yes, we were going camping, to which the man smiled slightly before stating in a creepy and ominous voice, better be careful. We nodded and gave a half-hearted thank you before continuing on to try to find the rest of the group, this time at a much faster pace. Although the man had been walking up the same trail as us when we saw him, he didn't continue but instead just stood there in the middle of the trail, watching us as we made our way up the winding path and disappeared from his view. Finally, we managed to catch up to the rest of the group who'd been waiting for us, and we told the adult counselors about our interaction with the man. They just shrugged it off, telling us that the guy probably lived in that cabin and just wanted to know what we were doing near his property. Still, I felt unnerved by the encounter, and when we finally arrived at the campsite, I couldn't shake the feeling that the man had somehow followed us. Eventually, though, I put it out of my mind and managed to enjoy myself a bit. Everyone else had gone to bed, and Jordan and the other counselor in training from the boys' cabin had brought two warm Mike's Harders that they had stolen from the counselor's quarters, and I took out a joint I had stashed away for this exact occasion. To avoid getting in trouble, we decided to hike out into the woods a bit to smoke the joint, and we made our way to the edge of the river where we had washed our pots and pans earlier in the day. The spot was eerily silent, and the thought of the man from earlier kept popping into my head, assuming that I was cold, not anxious. Jordan gave me his blue hoodie, and this prompted one of the other girls to suggest that we switch tents for the night, so I could sleep in the same tent with him, and she could sleep in the same tent as the other boy. I had absolutely no problem with this, and after smoking the joint, we made our way back to our tents, which were pitched slightly away from the others, and we discreetly sipped on the mics harders while telling scary camping stories. Some time passed, and one of the boys was in the middle of telling a rather muddled story that he was clearly making up on the spot when he suddenly stopped. In the silence, we could hear what sounded like footsteps crunching on pine needles about 40 feet away. 
near one of the other campers' tents. As we strained to listen to what was going on, the noises stopped, and even though we assumed it was just one of the campers getting up to go to the bathroom, being stoned and hopped up from the scary stories, we decided to call it a night and go hide in our tents. Jordan followed suit, and we awkwardly made out before eventually going to sleep. I don't know what time it was, but it must have been quite late when I suddenly woke up to the distinct sounds of footsteps walking around near my tent. Shot with adrenaline, I tried to lay as still as possible and quiet my breathing. From the sound, it was apparent that someone was less than three feet away from the front of my tent. Seemingly pacing back and forth, I turned to wake up Jordan, but I was immediately put at ease when I saw that he wasn't next to me. Assuming Jordan was the one I had been hearing, I closed my eyes and I was just beginning to drift back to sleep. When I heard the tent unzip, I felt Jordan lie down next to me, and after a few moments, he put his arms around me and began to spoon me. After nearly drifting off to sleep again, I realized I had to go to the bathroom and muttered something about having to go pee before beginning to unzip my sleeping bag. Seemingly annoyed by the noise, Jordan lazily turned over pulling his hoodie up over his head before going still again. Quietly, so as not to wake him, I unzipped the tent and quickly scanned the campsite for any movement. Comforting myself that Jordan had just gone pee and was fine, I put my shoes on and began making the trek across our campsite to the designated pee zone. I had just made it to the area and pulled my pants down when I heard rustling coming from the campsite as if someone was rummaging through our supplies and bags. Still slightly drunk, I tried to pull my pants up, and in my haste, I lost my balance and tried to catch myself with a branch that made a loud snapping noise when I grabbed it. I tried to gather myself as quietly as I could, but when I finally managed to look up, I could see that there was a figure making its way across our campsite in my direction. Before I could even think, I was blinded by the bright light of a flashlight shining directly into my eyes and the light was getting bigger, so whoever it was, they were coming toward me. Frozen and panicked, the figure got 10 feet away from me before I heard Jordan's voice say, sorry, it's just me. I breathed a sigh of relief, but then Jordan asked me something that really confused me. Have you seen my blue hoodie? I know you gave it back to me, but I think one of the campers might have stolen it from my bag while I was sleeping. After a brief pause, I managed to stutter out but you were just wearing it when you got back in the tent. What he said next made my blood run cold. What are you talking about? He said, it's been missing since we got back from the river. I even went down there to see if I had left it by accident, but after I couldn't find it, I thought I'd check the boy's bags, and that's when I saw you. My confusion quickly turned to sheer terror as I realized that the man who got into the tent with me just moments prior hadn't been Jordan. Sensing that something was wrong, Jordan asked me what happened, and I managed to get out that whoever stole his hoodie was sleeping in our tent. Not believing me, Jordan insisted on walking back to the tent to check it out. As slowly and quietly as possible, we made our way to the side of the tent, and when Jordan flipped on his flashlight and shined it through the nylon lining, he let out a high-pitched scream. We could both see the clear outline of a man's shadow lying still inside our tent. What happened next is a bit of a blur, but we ran to the pod of tents on the other side of the campground where the older counselors were sleeping, frantically unzipped their tent, and started yelling for them to come out and that there was a man in our tent. I remember panic setting in as our counselors slowly and groggily woke up, but after a bit more frantic yelling, they finally managed to understand the severity of the situation when a commotion broke out on the other side of camp near our tent. By the time they ran to the scene, however, they only found an unzipped tent and a bunch of our things littered on the ground that the man had apparently knocked over or thrown during his escape. After that, we heard the counselors radioing back down to the camp to call the police, and we could tell that they were as scared as we were. I don't think any of us slept after that, Luckily, we only had to wait a few hours for the sun to come up, and by that time, a few of the other counselors had arrived with guns to escort us back to camp. On our way back down, 
One of the campers found Jordan's jacket tied around one of the trees on the path like some kind of marker. Needless to say, he didn't want the hoodie back, and we just left it there. To this day, I can't say for certain that the man in the tent was the same guy that we ran into earlier on the trail, but his face and that night still haunt me. I want to start off by saying that everything I've written down here is true. None of it was made up. I'm not a scary story writer or anything. I just need to share this experience with someone, and I'm afraid of how the people around me will react. Me and my girlfriend like to use recreational drugs sometimes. They're called research chemicals. On Friday, July 29th, 2022, we used some uppers. The ones we used give you a rush of energy but have no psychedelic or hallucination inducing effects. We had a great time and slept it off the next day, both of us waking up late in the afternoon. We had a good breakfast, watched Netflix, and chilled for a while. She lives in a studio apartment and has pet rats, so we can't smoke inside because they have sensitive lungs. The building she lives in has a public balcony. So that's where we go out to smoke about every hour or so. It was a small balcony on the second floor with wood railings and a stone floor overlooking the neighborhood. The building rule was that nobody was allowed on the balcony after 10 p.m. We didn't really give a fuck about that rule and neither did anybody else. So we'd smoke there in the evenings too. It was on Saturday night, July 30th, that we went for a smoke outside again. It must have been half past midnight. We were reminiscing about the day before. About halfway through our cigarettes, I suddenly heard a weird noise very far in the background. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And since we were having a conversation, I tried to ignore it. It stopped after a couple of seconds. I noticed it stopped, but paid no mind. When our cigarettes were done, we were still just standing on the balcony talking. When I suddenly heard the sound again, and immediately asked my girlfriend to be quiet. Why? She asked. I responded with sh. I was listening to what that sound was. And as it was now quiet, I was able to hear it more clearly. After a few seconds, I realized what I was hearing, and I felt a cold chill running down my spine like my soul got sucked down through the floor. My whole face went pale. I hear a woman screaming, I said. She laughed at first and jokingly asked if I was high on something. I told her to shut up for a second and really listen. She noticed how dead serious I was, and she turned her ear towards the end of the balcony, and as she heard it, I saw her face turn just as pale. That's a woman screaming, she said. Our first thoughts were that somehow we had taken some really bad drugs and had some kind of weird shared psychosis after effect. We immediately checked if we had any symptoms of overdosing or after effects. No sweats, no high heart rate, no fatigue, no crazy thoughts. Both of us were able to think and talk clearly. We concluded that the sound we were hearing, a woman screaming, we real. The reason this struck us so was because it wasn't a normal kind of scream. It wasn't somebody getting scared, mugged or whatever. This scream was different. It echoed. It carried a hopelessness in its tone. It sounded so vague and far away, like it was carried to us by the winds. The scream sounded like somebody screamed their soul out of their body and into the sky. Both of us nailed to the floor. We kept listening in silence. Some loud ass teenagers were cycling home, probably from a bar or something, and screaming at each other. Both of us could finally breathe again. Well, that was the logical conclusion. Just some loud teenagers, she said. I initially agreed, but when they were far beyond what we could hear, the screams came back again. Their sound is even more desperate now. I did not hesitate and immediately called emergency services. I explained to them what we had heard and how it had affected us. They told us they'd be sending a police car over. We were outside in the parking lot near the main entrance, waiting for them. I still hear these faraway screams. The police arrived at a quarter to one. 
two officers, a male officer, and a female officer introduced themselves and asked us to explain in detail what we experienced. So we told them exactly what we heard and where we heard it from. The male officer didn't take it too seriously and tried to ease out of it by saying it was probably just mating frogs. Apparently, they make a scream-like sound when mating. The female officer took us more seriously and stood with us, listening, and very faintly, like whoever was screaming was running out of energy and time. We heard her again. So did the female officer. She immediately contacted the station, and they set out a search and rescue. We were thanked for reporting this, and they left. For me, it wasn't done yet, though. We sat back down on the balcony and kept listening. As we were sitting there, the night sky turned a pulsating blue from all the police cars driving around, trying to find this screaming woman. We sat there just listening to the continued screaming, hoping it would stop when they found her. It must have been about 20 minutes later, almost half past one, that the screams finally stopped. My hopes were that the police had found her and she was safe, but deep down, I had a feeling that she wasn't. That Wednesday, I was at my mother's house for dinner. She lives in the same town as me. During dinner, I told her what we had experienced and how frightening it all was. My mother stood up without saying a word, walked over to the living room, grabbed that day's paper, and handed it over to me. Woman found dead under a fallen tree, the headline read, I was shocked. I felt my eyes filling up with tears and said with a shaky voice, I heard this woman die, against my better judgment. I kept reading. The 47-year-old woman was on a midnight walk in the woods last Saturday night when a tree fell over and crushed her legs. Local authorities believe the woman may have survived for several hours before succumbing to her injuries. She had been dead for almost 72 hours before she was found. The police refused to share further details as to her identity or passing. There was more in the article, but I could not and refused to read it through my tears. I did not have it in me to share this with my girlfriend out of fear of how she would take it. But that's not the most disturbing part of all this. I live alone, and sometimes when I'm in bed and can't sleep, at half past midnight, I can still hear her screaming. Sometimes my doorbell rings in the middle of the night. But when I go to check, there's never anybody there. I had a camera doorbell installed and the only thing I caught on camera was the sound of my doorbell ringing. Sometimes, I hear a weird knocking sound, like somebody is banging on wood. Stuff in my house seems to relocate on its own, such as clothing, food, and tools. My fridge door sometimes opens by itself. Whenever I look at my kitchen door, it feels like something is watching me. My cat Robin seems to stare at nothing in corners, and sometimes even gets a big tail and starts hissing at these empty corners. Ever since all that happened, my TV has this weird thing where it turns itself back on after I turn it off. It's only when I take the plug out of the socket that it stays off. All these things seem to only happen between half past midnight and half past one. The most horrible thing is that I can hear her screaming when it's silent around me. I called my doctor about this because I thought I was going insane. She referred me to a team of therapists. After countless hours of talks and sessions, they confirmed that I suffer from no form of delusion, hallucinations, psychosis, or any other mental illness that could cause me to experience all this. But I still do. She still screams at me. Last night, January 2nd, 2020, three, I heard her screaming and banging again. When I went to bed and shut the lights off, I kept having this feeling like someone was standing next to my bed, watching me. And so I decided today, January 3rd, that I should write down this experience and share it in hopes that she may find some rest in the knowledge that she won't be forgotten. Since we never got a name, I simply call her the Screaming Woman. May she rest in peace. I grew up in a haunted demonic house, and it's now been abandoned since we moved out. Brisbane, Australia. I don't often talk about it, 
because it's definitely scarred me and just talking about it freaks me out. But here we go. I was about nine years old. I'm now 27 and my parents decided to move out of a small apartment complex and start renting a house together in Brisbane. We couldn't afford much, so it was a cheap and very old looking house. Nothing major my dad couldn't fix up, he thought. Keep in mind that the owner of the property lived in another state, so it was hard to get in contact with him. So once moving in, there were red flags right from the get-go. When we moved in, there was a big, gross, and tacky-looking rug in the kitchen with weird, old, blood-looking stains. Nope, that's got to go, we thought. We rolled it up and chucked it out. The property had a big backyard of acreage, so there were lots of trees. For some reason, upside-down horseshoes were nailed to some of the trees and one in the kitchen. Again, we thought fucking nope. Too weird and creepy. That's going. Years later, after looking more into it, we found out that hanging upside down horseshoes was meant for good luck and to get rid of negative energy. But we didn't realize this at the time, and after taking them down, we went through many years of bad luck throughout our lives while living in this house. At first, apart from the house looking creepy and old, there were no physical signs of anything paranormal. But as a kid, I loved playing outdoors. I was a big tomboy, especially having a big acreage of land in our backyard. But soon enough, being a kid who plays in the dirt, I started to find things in the dirt. I found clothing buried in random parts of the property. My mom would occasionally see little bits of cloth sticking out of the dirt too. Being curious, we dug them out, and it was always the clothing of a woman or a child. Sometimes even the odd shoe comes here and there. My parents didn't seem to care too much, and my dad was a skeptic. They always had some excuse for why stuff was there. My house was lifted from the ground so I could go under the house and play. One day, I found a bone buried under there. This is when my mom realized there were too many coincidences and told my dad. She wanted to report it to the police, but my dad just said don't waste your time. It's most likely old cattle bones. So we listened to my dad. Soon enough, the paranormal began. My dad always worked nights, leaving just me and my mom in the house alone, but it no longer felt like we were alone. In the living room, we had one computer at the time, back when dial-up internet was still a thing. This was the family computer. My mom was on it one night, and I stood behind her and watched her as we spoke to each other. I then felt a hand grab me on my shoulder from behind. I turned around, thinking it was my dad coming home early, because it felt so real. I turned around and no one was there, and my dad wasn't home yet. Another night, we had an old sunroom that was my bedroom. It was the middle of the night, and I was asleep, until I was woken up by my Furby toy on the shelf, making noises. For those younglings, Furbies had a sensor and would talk if they sensed you in front of them. It made a few noises, then stopped. My bed was too far from it to sense me. I turned the lights on and walked over to the Furby to switch it off, but the switch was already off. Eventually, I began to have the same nightmare every single night. It always felt very vivid and real. The dream was me tied up with rope to an old bed with springs and no mattress in my very same bedroom, but it was different. There was no light bulb, no electricity, and no other furniture in the room besides a bedside table next to me with an old timely candle on a plate. It almost seemed like a different time period. I would be yanking my arms and legs trying to flee, but I could never escape. No matter how hard I tried, I would wake up in a sweat. I had the same nightmare practically every single night, and sometimes it would result in three claw marks on my stomach. I didn't know this as a kid, but looking into it now, that's a sign of a demonic entity. It was so mentally exhausting. I couldn't handle being alone in my room anymore. By this point, I was about 10 or 11. I was too scared to talk about it and tell my parents what exactly was going on. No one believes a little kid, I thought, but I would come crying to them and demand not to sleep in my bedroom anymore. Being around 11, 
Most kids that age would love to have their own bedroom, but no, fuck that. So most nights I would sleep on a blow up mattress in my parents' room on the floor. The nightmares only happened every other night instead of every night. I then started to sleepwalk. I don't have any memory of this, but my parents told me I used to sit up, scream and cry hysterically while pointing at their bedroom window that faced a view of the front door and steps at ridiculous hours of the morning. I would scream my lungs out for them to shut the window. Don't let him in. My mom was freaked out by this, as you would be, but my dad, being the grump, just said I was going through some phase and that I needed to let him sleep for work since he works most of the night. Over time, my mom would hear me walking on the floorboards in the middle of the night while dad was at work, but nobody was in the house. The ceiling fan we had in the kitchen would turn itself on even when it was flicked off at the wall. We had lots of random bad luck happening, ranging from all sorts of things. The thing that stood out to me was, my parents were starting to grow the family. My baby brother at the time was just starting to walk, but that beautiful memory was ruined shortly after learning to walk. Out of nowhere, he was bedridden. He wouldn't sleep, he wouldn't eat, and he now couldn't walk. It was so heartbreaking to see this happy baby's development ruined. We took him to the emergency room. He no longer could move his spine. We went to the doctor after the doctor did tests, and none of them could figure out what was wrong with him. He seemed to have some sort of disease that was never heard of, or so we thought. We had so much bad luck going on. And this, to top it off, had us all in just a horrible place. One doctor even said, he's faking it. We did x-rays, and there's nothing there. Okay. But why the fuck can't he move then? Finally, another doctor finally figured it out. He had gotten some sort of very rare cyst in his spine that they had never even seen before. They only read about it in textbooks. It was close to bursting and paralyzing him for life. After months of being in and out of hospitals, we were finally starting to move on with our lives. But then, having acreage and being animal people, we built a chicken coop shit. We had it for a while, but one morning we woke up to feed the chickens, but no chickens were in there. The chicken coop door was wide open. We always locked it with a bolt so no chickens could escape. Where are the chickens? There were at least 10. We found them. Well, part of them. All of the chicken heads were hacked off. No bodies were found. Just the heads were laid out neatly in a straight line in our yard. That was the final straw. My dad stopped being a stubborn fuckhead and called the police. No suspects were found. Again, looking into this more, chicken heads are also a ritual belief for sacrificing. We struggled with money, but we finally moved out of the house. The nightmare stopped, and now it's been 10 years. The house has remained there with no residents ever since. It's now overgrown and decaying. Sometimes, when I'm in the area, I feel drawn to drive past and look at it. Every so often, I'll drive by and gaze at its decay. I've been on a few haunted investigations, but this is the one place I'm too scared to step foot in. It brings back a lot of trauma and pain. I'll never forget how terrifying this place was. I have a little update on this story if you're interested in hearing more. I would love to hear your thoughts or similar experiences.